Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Harvard Law Forum. We are the nation's longest running law school speaker series. We have had Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, Malcolm X, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jimmy Carter, JFK, and many others speak at the forum over its 70th, uh, 70 year history. And I'm so glad to have two more uh, forum speakers here today who are wonderful and inspiring activists. Uh, just to get some things out of the way, um, we have a urban, uh, uh, urban innovation talk coming up. We have Keith Ellison next Monday. We have legal resistance to the Trump administration next Tuesday. And we have a post-Trump agenda for a divided America from a great policy thinker, Isabel Sawhill, next Thursday. Check out the Harvard Law Forum on Facebook for more information. Uh, for our event today, we have Carl Root and Pastor Donna Lynn Hubbard. They are civic and religious leaders in Atlanta, Georgia. Formerly incarcerated citizens themselves, they are inspiring advocates for a better prison reentry system. Carl Root is the co-founder of both the National Association of Previous Prisoners, a community agency providing support for returning citizens, and the Young Fathers of Metro Atlanta, a community agency that provides fatherhood services to young Atlantans. Pastor Donna Hubbard is the founder of the Women at the Well Transition Center, a nonprofit ministry providing services to formerly incarcerated persons. And she is also the author of The Parenting from Prison Project, uh, an active program in many county jails around Atlanta. I wanted to bring them here because we read about a lot of these issues in our books. We read about the criminal justice system, but they know the reality of it and how to build a better prison system themselves. They've been doing it for decades. I love uh, showing off dedication at our Harvard Law Forum events. This is a picture of Carl and Pastor Donna from 20 years ago working on uh, prison reentry, helping people out, and they're still at it 20 years later, and they've had a lot of uh, wins for the city of Atlanta. So without further ado, who's going first? We got Pastor Donna Hubbard. Let's give her a Harvard Law Forum hand. Applause. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all. OK, that, that sounded like a pizza good afternoon. <laughs> Let me hear a Harvard Law School. I'm glad I'm getting out of here soon. And this has been a great experience. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Very good. Thank you. I, I am beyond humbled to be here. I, um, I don't want to get emotional, because normally my presentation is emotional. But <coughs> my uncle, who passed away many years ago, graduated from Harvard went on to teach at Northwestern, one of two African Americans in his class back then. But his, his wife, my aunt, graduated from Radcliffe the same year. I wanted to go to Harvard Law School growing up and actually had, my, uh, had, a, had a sponsor, Ernest Hayek, who is a uh, the dean of the Judicial College in Reno, Nevada, who was going to sponsor my, my education. But what was more interesting is that God had a greater plan for me that I didn't know would include standing before my future judicial leaders at Harvard. I could never have imagined it. I grew up in um, between Atlanta, Georgia, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I call, you know, at that time we had high poverty, low poverty, and middle poverty. So I would say that my family was middle poverty. And uh, there were still middle family. That was my mother and my stepfather. My father, my natural father is Nigerian. My mother is a Catawba Indian. And it was, uh, it, it uh, lent a very uh, interesting, to make a very interesting breed <laughs> for, for us. My mother's family, uh, who still, many of them still live on the Catawba Indian Reservation. But my mother's great-grandmother was one of the first Native American women to earn a college degree. And I said to him when Pete told us earlier that this was an Indian college at one time, and I wondered, did my great-great-grandmother go to school here? So you just never know how your journey will come back around. So 
I won't, I have 15 minutes and I want to use it to give you some information about who I am and what I do and why it, it makes a difference. And so I'm Pastor Donna Hubbard. I run Woman at the Well Transition Center, but I wasn't always Pastor Donna Hubbard. I was 03709041, which was my, my number that they gave me when I went to federal prison. As I said, I was raised in a middle poverty home growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At a young age, I was married off at 16 years old to a man I didn't know. My marriage was arranged. Yes, they still did it in the United States. And so I ended up marrying a man at 16 I didn't know. And I had graduated from high school, valedictorian in my class, most likely to succeed, all of the accolades in a Muslim family, in a Muslim household. And so um, I wanted to go to college. As I said, I wanted to go to law school one day. <coughs> But I found myself at 16, graduating from high school with my oldest daughter on my hip. And I kind of knew that things in my life were going to change because I was starting off with a handicap, or at least what I considered a handicap. Today I know that they pushed me to be greater. So I, um, here I am. I ended up at 20 with three children. Anybody 20 years old, 24 in here? If you can imagine what I was like at 20 years old, I had three children, a high school education, struggling to make it through Jackson State College with no support. Um, I moved to Washington, D.C. to get away from a husband who abused me <coughs> constantly because he did not like the fact that I went to college. And when I moved to Washington, D.C., I applied for a job as a flight attendant. I didn't even know what that meant, y'all. I didn't. So I knew that they worked on the airplane, but that was about as much as I really understood. Here I am, three children. By then I was 22, and I applied for a job as a flight attendant. And I was the only one out of all the people they interviewed that got it. Go figure, right? So I met a man who was a professional baseball player who set me up to be gang raped. He treated me like I was a million dollars. I was arm candy. I was pretty, I was smart, and we went to a penthouse party one time. I was drinking champagne, y'all. I thought I was living high until I woke up and there was a man on top of me and another group of men standing on the wall waiting their turn. After a while, I passed out. I don't know how long it lasted, but when I woke up, I was alone in that room. I left there ashamed and afraid and confused. I couldn't understand what I had done, what had happened. I went home, went back to my job, and began to anesthetize myself with drugs and alcohol to try to forget what happened. I ended up leaving there, going to California. I was running. I was running away from the men who would whisper things in my ear. And I ran to California, where I ended up <clears throat> with a pimp and being owned by a gang. It didn't take long after that for me to be arrested with the gang that was trafficking me. And I was sentenced to two 12-year sentences in federal prison. And I wondered, how did this little girl end up in prison with 24, with 24 years? That's what they gave me. I went to federal prison. And it was in federal prison that I began to look around me and see the other women who were there like myself. And even though I felt like I was the only one going through what I was going through, I saw so many other women who were going through what I went through and then some. But there were no options for us to improve the quality of our lives. So I took it upon myself to create for myself a path to improve the quality of my life. Because I refused to believe that I was going to be in there forever. And 24 years even. And I built the program, I built this, this program for myself to create a better life around accountability, commitment, and consistency. Because I believe that those were the three things that were going to improve the quality of my life. That took me through 10 years of incarceration. My uncle, Benjamin Malcolm, was the first African American appointed to the Federal Parole Commission by President Jim Carter. He represented me at the parole board and I was able to be released. It took 10 years of going in and out of prison 
There was never a recommendation for any kind of reform. There was never a recommendation for drug treatment. There was never a recommendation for any kind of, of counseling. They just figured I was a fast-tailed girl who hung out with the wrong kind of boys and ended up in prison. But what they didn't understand is that God had a greater purpose for what I was going through. And when I was released, I went to Atlanta, Georgia. I had no family there. My father was it. And I had never, I hadn't met my father, who's like, as I said, Nigerian. But I, I had met him one time in my whole entire life. And he had done prison time. When I got out, I went to Atlanta, and I looked around me and realized that there were no resources for women like myself. There was no way to get my children back. There was no way to find a job. There was one agency, Age Twin Prison Mothers, that was run by a woman named Sandra Barnhill, who herself is an attorney. And she took me under her wing, not even realizing what that meant. I just knew that I needed to get my life back. I wanted to get my children back. I wanted to be able to look at myself in the mirror and not be ashamed of the things that had happened to me and the things that I had done. And I knew that there was a greater purpose in my life for everything I had gone through. I was beaten and left for dead. I had a $1,000 a day cocaine habit. And I was sentenced to 24 years in federal maximum security prison. Talk about somebody who felt like they had, the bottom was falling out. And yet, out of that was birth woman at the Well Transition Center. And Sandra said, I'm going to concentrate on the children, Donna. You concentrate on mothers like yourself. So Woman at the Well Transition Center now is celebrating 20 years in August. We will, be, we will have done 20 years of working with women who are formerly incarcerated and um, on the streets and those who are rescued from human trafficking. Um, 20 years of trying to provide direct services, create options for them to have their records expunged, create opportunities for them to regain their children. Our mission statement is that our mission is to assist incarcerated, formerly incarcerated women, women impacted by the criminal justice system or rescued from human trafficking to regain their lives, their families, and their dignity. And I say to you, our future lawmakers, to be very aware as you go forward not to criminalize victims. And that is the sad aspect of our judicial system is that there is a very, very thin line between the victim and the criminal. Thank you so much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, Harvard Law School students, friends, guests. Thank you, Pete Davis, for inviting me, and thank all of you for being here. My name is Carl Lewis Root, Jr. I was named after a man who divorced my mom after eight months, and I didn't get to know who he was and what I was about. At any rate, I want to start off by saying a little bit about myself. I'm so humbled and honored to be here today. This is perhaps the largest platform that I've ever been on, and I'm very, very grateful. A nickel bag of marijuana got me involved in this thing and almost destroyed my life. You see, I got arrested, convicted, and sentenced under the drug laws of the 1980 when they were doing mandatory minimums. They found less than an ounce, less than an ounce like I said, maybe a nickel bag of marijuana, but they found a scale and some empty nickel bags which made it intent to distribute. Possession of marijuana with intent to distribute. The mandatory minimum sentence was 10 years. I got a 10 year sentence. This is 1983. Believe it or not, my biggest dream 
because I was so inspired by Perry Mason and Ironside and L.A. Law <laughs> that I would go to a school like Harvard Law School one day. However, the collateral consequences of that conviction and that label of being a felon, that ruined that dream for me. I come from a humble background, grew up in the rural South, Albany, Georgia, a place where Martin Luther King went to do a civil rights march and went straight to jail. He got out of the Greyhound, off the Greyhound Trailway bus and stepped right into a paddy wagon. Because in Albany, Georgia, Albany, not Albany, Albany, Georgia, they didn't play that. So they put him right in jail. But this is where I grew up. In the Jim Crow South, I was born in 1957, you see. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, my mom said, you were almost born in the maternity ward. But a lady came in right before I got a chance to go, so they had to take you down to the basement. I said, wow, mom, that's encouraging. <laughs> but that's the America that we lived in at that time. Now, I said the Pledge of Allegiance because it so impacted my life. I was so excited to be able to recite to memorize and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. So I said it with such enthusiasm. I was just, I just loved learning and I loved belonging. I felt like I belonged when I said the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all. But then I got older and guess what I found out? That those words really didn't apply to me. So I became somewhat disillusioned and I started acting out in a very immature fashion and it caused me to start running into problems with authority because I wanted to belong. I felt like I belonged. I had hopes and dreams just like every other young person that I knew. But those dreams came crashing down when I got confronted by the laws of the Jim Crow South. Anyway, the yearly highlight of my life my otherwise dull and dismal upbringing was a summertime visit to a huge farm in South Georgia with cows and pigs and, and, and lots of vegetables. Everyone in that farm family, there were 12 children, and they all worked hard. Now, the landowners had been promised by the sharecropper that they were working for that they would one day own that land. However, that never came to fruition, all right? My mom was very, she got real upset with that. So she started creating paths for me to learn. She always told me, good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good becomes your better and your better best. Because you will not be a part of this system. You will outrun this racist system. And I bought into that, y'all. I studied hard. I loved learning. I did a lot of things that I could. I was a straight-A student. I, I always got 100% lunchroom participation at school. <laughs> and I always got 100% attendance. And I always made honor roll. And I always got S's and E's on my progress report. And I made straight A's until the sixth grade. They sent me to... In all white school, they, they tried this program. Today they call them magnet programs. And they sent me to this all white school. Now, lo and behold, I wanted to go to a black school. We all want to belong to a tribe. We want to feel connected. I had to walk about 10 blocks to this white school. Now, my mom considered it a privilege, but it was a hardship for me because prior to going to that school, I got straight A's. I, had, I always had the best handwriting in my class, but guess what? I started getting U's on my report card. I got a C for the first time in my life. I'm in the sixth grade. I'm 11 years old, and I'm, I'm facing a system that's really, really harsh to me, and I'm not understanding it. And I'm saying, wow, I don't like this. So things began to change for me. I took on a different mindset. I began to act out in various and sundry ways. As a youngster, I was fortunate enough, though, to, to, to partake in a swimming program. Every summer, we would have a swim program where we got to 
have free swim lessons from 9 in the morning until 12 o'clock, and then they would feed us lunch, and then we had free swim from 1 to 6. I did it every day. I became so proficient at swimming at 12 years old, they made me a junior lifeguard. My idol at that time was Mark Spitz, Johnny Weissmiller, the guy who used to play Tarzan. So I got to a place where I actually started trying to breathe underwater. <laughs> I loved swimming. I did it with all my heart and soul. By the time I was 16 years old, the local colleges had come looking at me and timing me and swimming. And I would watch the Olympics, and I would try the dives that I saw at the Olympics at a pool that was only eight feet deep. And I was so, my form was so nice that when I entered the water, I went straight to the bottom of that eight feet pool. And I had to learn to put my hands down to push myself up off the bottom when I hit it. But I was obviously pretty good. I received a full scholarship to Morehouse College at 16 years old. Guess what? I didn't want anything to do with Morehouse College. I didn't want to go to college. By that time, I had gotten introduced to the thug lifestyle. Girls were telling me that I was cute. The thugs were telling me that I was the future of Albany because I was a great athlete. I was a great swimmer. So all of that encouraged me to start doing anything I was big enough and bad enough to do. Anyway, I went to a major university in Atlanta after coming out of the Army. I had a GI Bill. I did two years in the Army, and I came home with a heroin addiction. And in order to cope with that heroin addiction, I tried to go into the VA hospital, and there was no openings for me there. So I went, and I sat on the steps, and I said, somebody's going to let me in. And I didn't move until I got in, but I got in. And there was this, old, this group of, of elder white women who asked me, what's a young man like you doing here at this VA hospital with all of these Vietnam veterans, these broken down old men? I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to overcome an addiction. And they said, well, what can we do for you? I said, well, I got a GI Bill, but I can't get in school. I don't think I'll be able to qualify to get in school. And they said, we'll help you. And they helped me to get into school. I had been at that VA hospital for about six months. I got into school and I made great grades again. I made the, it wasn't the dean's list, but I made straight A's and they put it in the newspaper. And the veterans administrator called me and he said, young man, we see that you can perform. You can take care of yourself. So you need to leave the VA hospital and vacate this room for somebody who really needs it because you have all the capability of taking care of yourself. So my journey began, and I went home, and I was able to use my GI Bill to go to school. And I went to school, and while I was going to school getting my GI Bill, I lived in a neighborhood where people steal, and they started taking my check from a mailbox. And I was smoking marijuana at the time, so everybody that I knew, they say, hey, well, Carl, uh, will you get me some? And this is how I got that conviction of marijuana. Every time I purchased for myself, I would purchase for my friends as well. But again, I got busted. And this was in February of 1983, during Black History Month. I'll never forget it. They came to the campus where I was on the Student Government Association. This is a 1983 picture. I got out of jail in October of 1983, and I went to school, and this picture was taken October of 1983. I ran for every position on the Student Government Association. President, vice president, recorder. <laughs> they eventually gave me recorder. <laughs> and because I had never done it before, I said, you know what, I love to make the dean's list at this school while I'm here. I needed, to make, I needed six A's to get the dean's list. I made the dean's list. And I was so proud of myself, I said, you know what, I can do this. I can do this. And then I got who's who in American junior colleges. Now, mind you, 
in the back of my mind, I wanted to be an organized gangster, I must confess. I said, you know, if I'm an organized gangster, won't nobody be messing with me. Won't nobody be messing with me. These Jim Crow folk, they won't be messing with me. But everywhere I went, people kept telling me, there ain't no gangster in you. You're one of the smartest men in America. And I rejected that because I did not want to be labeled as such. I wanted street credibility because just about everybody that I knew had street credibility. At any rate, I went to a school after I graduated from the junior college. I went to another university in Atlanta, Georgia from Albany, and I, they had a swim team. I walked into the swim team. They gave me a full scholarship. However, I had that label as a felon, and they took the scholarship from me. I got nominated for the National Blue Key Honor Society. When I went to visit, it was a beautiful place. A couple of days later, I got a letter saying, we checked your background, and I'm sorry. We have to reject your application. So I said, wow, this is really, really, really bad. <laughs> I was working a work-study job because I'm poor. My people are poor. I was only the second person to go to college from my family. I worked a work-study job, and the man that was my boss, he said, listen, Carl, I got a real job. Why don't you take this job over? You know it. Why don't you apply? They'll give it to you. I applied. They did a background check. And guess what? Now, these are the kinds of people that are dealing with the collateral consequences of being labeled a convicted felon. I am just the poster boy right now for that. <laughs> My story is the story of approximately seven million Americans. You see, out of the 7.5 Americans who have been under some form of correctional control, only 2.2 million are actually in prison. The rest of them are doing their time on the outside, like I was, paying their own way, having to pay rent, having to go to work every day. They're not in prison, but they're not sexy enough for real good jobs or housing or, or public benefits. I was turned down for all kinds of benefits. So when I applied for that job, the human resource department said, young man, what do you think this is? This is, an high, this is an institution of higher learning, of which I was a great student. And they turned me down for it, said, not only are you not eligible for this job that you're applying for, but your work study job in general is terminated because this is not a ditch digging factory. With your background, you shouldn't, I don't know why they let you in the school. I sued them. I represented myself. They paid me. The reason I didn't mention the name of the school was because you know what those smart attorneys did? They made me sign something saying that I never named the school. All right? And I didn't name it, did I? But these are the collateral consequences of being labeled a convicted felon, and we have millions in America. I represent and stand on the shoulder of upwards of 650,000 people who are released from correctional control every year. That's a lot of Americans. We only represent in the United States of America 5% of the world's population, but we incarcerate 25% of the world's population. We've become incarceration nation, but what we've done is we've built the prison industrial com complex has become something akin to a caste-like system. I've always felt like a second-class citizen anyway, but after I got the Felony conviction, it took it to a whole nother level. You know, it says in the Constitution, the only way that a person can be re-enslaved is if they've been convicted of a felony crime. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you can make a person work for free in America anymore. So if you've been convicted of a felony crime, they can legally discriminate against you. 
And I knew a lot of those people. Donna and I have been working with those people for years. I started an organization called the National Association of Previous Prison Prisoners for a reason, because there were many like myself who can't speak the language. You see, I can communicate a little bit. But there's Ray Ray and Pookie. They communicate just a little bit different. And people don't hear them like they hear me. So I intend to be a voice for the voiceless, for those who can't speak the language like we want to. They're not sexy for forums like this. They're not sexy enough for forums like this because they might throw some verbs and some, you know, get real creative with the language. <laughs> so I intended to represent them. And the National Association of Previous Prisoners was just that, a support group for those returning citizens. We went from ex-convicts to ex-offenders. We've changed the language today. Please, if you ever have to use the language, please refer to those like me and Pastor Donna as returning citizens. It adds humanity to the face. Please refer to people like us as formerly incarcerated persons because we're people, we're not ex-offenders. I might offend somebody right now. <laughs> so let's, the words that we use, words are so very, very powerful, and you guys are gonna be some great linguists. You guys are gonna be using words, you guys are gonna be throwing around some words that will change lives. So please understand the value of your words. I've learned that after your time is served on the inside, you begin a life sentence on the outside in America. Please understand me, I coined that phrase. I was arrested for possession of marijuana, about a nickel bag. A charge of intent to distribute was added due to circumstantial evidence because I had a scale and some nickel bags. I went to a real dark place after I got that label. I've experienced a lot of collateral consequences and a lot of times, guess what, I almost gave up. You know, I started using cocaine and, and I was a poly drug user and I ended up addicted and I had to work through that. So I've been in, I'm a major advocate of support groups, uh, NA, AA. These programs really hurt help people who are struggling. So if you know anyone that's going through as I have, please refer them to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Sex Anonymous, whatever their lot is, please refer them because those groups help. That's why I started the National Association of Previous Prisoners because when people have a platform from which to speak on their issues, they can get some stuff out instead of acting out in a way that will cause them to go back to prison because you see people, like I said, most of the people doing time are doing time on the outside and they have technical violations. They might smoke a joint of marijuana, fail a drug test while they're on probation or parole and they have to serve the rest of that time. If they're doing 20 years on parole or probation, if they get caught with a dirty urine, they will have to go and serve the remainder of that time. And most people go back for technical violations. So please try and help in that regard. I got terminated from my internship. I decided my last, I had two courses left, a statistics class, which I hated, <laughs> and an internship that was mandatory in order for me to graduate from this college. I chose to do my internship with the State Board of Pardons and Parole. Why, you think? Because I figured they'd let me off of my probation. I had about seven years left. And they said, oh, Carl, after they allowed me to waste a few months in the office, Carl, we did a background check. And ooh, we, while we love you and you're a great person, policy has it that you can't work in here because you have a felony on your record. And they kicked me out. And I lost the rest of my entitlement to my GI Bill benefit. So right now, today, that was in 1986. Right now, today, I still got those two classes left. I still have not graduated. 
And guess what? I want that so bad, you just don't know. So I paid the high cost of low living. I went to a really dark place after that because I really wanted my degree. I've suffered in silence because I wasn't sexy enough for sensationalizing media. They wanted to talk to murderers and rapists and, you know, people mm -hmm. with great stories like Pastor Donna. They didn't want to talk to me. You got busted with a nickel bag. <clears throat> we don't want to talk to you. Ain't nothing sexy about you. We won't sell any papers with your story. And then you're a pretty smart guy. Nobody cares about smart guys. We want murderers and rapists and people who have done, you know, people who talk like this. You understand? So I wasn't sexy enough for sensationalizing media, so I struggled to survive with a wife and several children just eking out an existence with mediocre jobs, low-paying jobs, with menial salaries. And guess what? I didn't vote because I didn't know until I applied for my rights of citizenship to be restored that I could vote. They said, well, you were sentenced under the First Offender Act. You never lost your rights of citizenship. I said, what? I thought all of my rights were taken away from me since I had been a convicted felon. I don't know, Georgia's is a little bit slower than other states as far as I'm concerned. They either didn't know or they just didn't tell me, but I didn't vote until very, very recently, and that was when <laughs> that was when, uh, right before President Barack Obama came on the scene, I got a chance to vote, and it was, it was an exhilarating experience. Anyway, this led to my becoming a staunch criminal justice reform and civil rights advocate because I recognized there are a lot of people out there who were going through as I had, and they needed help. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I wrote it down in a book called Born Captive, Made Free. You don't get to choose your family or your parents. I didn't get to choose my family or my parents. It's all in this book. This book was recently released on 21st of this month. Boy, man, father, about responsible fatherhood. I mentioned that my daddy, I was named after my daddy, but yet he did nothing to tell me who I was or what I was to do. So I'm really, really serious about boyhood, manhood, and fatherhood development in these United States. I have Born Captain Made Free, $10 a copy if you're interested. And I'd just like to say thank you for being here and for allowing me to share my story. Start, I'll start a question off, which is, tell us a bit about um, the state of the state of reentry in uh, Georgia right now, and some of the work you're doing um, with people who are coming out of prison right now. Um, and what are some of the major challenges folks are facing um, that you work with, either with uh, uh, with each of your organizations? Um, well, I'll start because I know they don't have a chance to catch me, right? Um, when I started, when, when Women at the Wealth Transition Center started, basically our focus was working with uh, women who are formerly incarcerated that were mothers as well. Um, to and basically we started as a support group. We needed to know who was where, where we could find a place to live, how where we could get clothes, um, how did, how are we going to get our children back because some of us our children were taken from us, um, and and who's hiring. Um, and we would switch clothes, literally. We would meet each other and give each other the suit that I wore to my job interview and let somebody else wear it to their job interview because we didn't get clothes. We, you know, it was hard to find a place to live because you had, if you had a, a drug conviction now, you could no longer live in public housing. You couldn't get a Section 8 housing. So um, that's kind of how Women at the Well Transition Center started. Over these these 20 some years, I have watched, uh, I've watched the prison system in Georgia change, mostly because the people, those of us who are in the grassroots uh, field, those of us who are boots on the ground working to see reform happen, mostly because of that, not necessarily because we had politicians that supported us. We literally had to convince them that these changes needed to be made. 
people like myself and Carl had to go in front of congressmen and legislators and uh, even the governor and our city council members to advocate on behalf of formerly incarcerated persons. Um, for things as simple as when, when uh, I opened my first transition center, we had four beds. And that's not, when you start talking about the number of women who are incarcerated in Georgia and they're getting out with no place to go. Many of them have families that won't take them back. Some of them don't have any family anymore. Some of them uh, can't go back to where they were. And so the thing that stood out the most to me is that when the women were released and they came to our program, the system gave them five days to get a job. Either you get a job in five days or you're going back to jail. And you know, we were, we were running around trying to find people who would hire a formerly incarcerated persons uh, in five days. Impossible. It took that long just to do the background check, just to get an interview. Um, and I, I went to the um, parole board, I went to the uh, probation and parole commission, and I said, listen, these people didn't go to jail for being unemployed. So how can you force them in five days to find a job when they, for some of them, just getting, you know, I told them, I said, we can get them a job, but if, if we don't stabilize them, those that have a history of substance abuse, they're not going to keep a job. So first thing we have to do is stabilize them, get them into some kind of support program so that they will be able to be stabilized when they get a job. It took us three years. It took us three years to even get in front of the parole board and parole commission for them to agree to allow us two weeks. So now they have two weeks before they have to get a job. And for many of these women, two weeks still, you know, they have, met, they have neglected health care issues, they have family issues, um, they're, they're dealing with being stable, we've got mental health issues, um, victimization, you know, all of the, the things that go into um, creating a supportive background. And so I would say that today, while we've made some leaps and bounds in, in cosmetic ways, things like getting extra time to get jobs, we still have a long way to go in, in terms of how, of whether they can get their children back, uh, in terms of hiring practices. I would say that Carl and I are the exception, not the norm. Our goal in this platform is to make sure that we become the norm, that it does happen for other people like ourselves. But we are the exception and not the norm. Today, I'm a flight attendant for American Airlines, and they hired me in spite of everything that was on my record. My record was presented to them. I laid it out. And they hired me with the recommendation of congressmen, uh, governors, uh, state legislators, people who wrote letters on my behalf because of the work that I've done since my release. So today, I'm a flight attendant. I travel around the world to train aviation specialists, uh, law enforcement, first responders on how to recognize and report human trafficking. And, and may I interject? Uh, we still have a long way to go. I still don't have a job. I uh, just recently got fired from Kroger because uh, they did a background check. And uh, I was working for Fulton County government where I live, and they did away with the program that I was uh, leading up. I worked with teen fathers, young men 13 to 19 years old who had a child or a child on the way. And they did away with the program, so I founded Young Fathers of Metro Atlanta to replace that program because these young men need to be taught how to be responsible for the children that they bring into this world. But right now, Don and I drive, I drive with Lyft. I drive for Lyft right now. And uh, I have seven grown children. My baby is 28 years old. My oldest is 42 years old. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, and I'm, we're struggling, you know. If it wasn't for the sale of these books, I wouldn't be here with you all today. We finance the work that we do as a nonprofit agency by just doing whatever we, I pick up paper, I'll sell cans. Yeah. Because the work is just that important. So we still have a long way to go. And we're serving people that employment and housing is vital to people that are coming out of prison. And if they're sex offenders, and I mean not real bad sex offenders like rapists and, and, and molesters and people, I'm saying an 18 year old boy who may have had sex with a 16 year old girl will be labeled a sex offender. And they have to sign a, a, a register to move in certain communities. There are certain communities they're not even welcome in. And it's hard to, to place people like that. It's hard to find people jobs like that. And these are the people that 
I choose to work with. Uh, we work with an agency called Aid to Children of Imprisoned Mothers, which is now a national organization. We, 20 years, I think, to celebrate 25 years. But I was a driver, volunteer, mind you. Everybody wants us to volunteer our time and our service. My wife is always telling me, you need a job. But I'm saying, somebody's got to do this work. We used to take children, aid to children of imprisoned mothers. Our mission was to take children, the children of incarcerated women like Donna to visit them at the prison. Because there was no other transportation. There was no other transportation. So I volunteered to do that. I did that for years. I ended up sitting on that board for a number of years because they needed somebody who was doing that kind of work, who had a passion for it. But guess what? It didn't pay. I work for a nonprofit agency right now, Community Council of Metro Atlanta, okay? And I mean, it's a nonprofit. So most nonprofits are struggling and they really don't have the money to pay its people what they're worth. So it's a struggle for returning citizens to find ample employment, a decent a wage. It's hard for them to find decent housing and to live in safe communities. And guess what? Some of the best and brightest people you will ever meet are locked up in some, some of our prisons and jails. And, and the, sometimes the you know, we look at cases that Carl and I both deal with, and often we'll have a case on our caseload um, then we'll call each other and say, hey, I need help with this. You yes. know, do, you have, do you have any resources for this young man getting out? He'll, I'll call him. He'll call me and say, hey, there's this mother that's getting out. We have, and you know, you talk about sex offenders not being, uh, uh, or being labeled as sex offenders. We have a woman uh, that I had on my caseload who, uh, her husband was a pimp. She didn't know it at the time when she married him. She was a young girl. She fell in love with him. And he pimped her out. Uh, she had a daughter who at the time was four years old. By the time the daughter became 12, he started uh, raping the daughter and forcing the mother to watch. Eventually, he was arrested, but they also arrested the mother. Every time she would even go near the telephone to call the police or to act like she was going to tell somebody, he would beat the life out of her. And eventually, she was arrested. She did time and was convicted as a sex offender because she watched. So, you know, the, yeah, the, uh, the, you know, the challenge of placing people like this is, is ongoing. Uh, and by the way, Carl is, are you a grandfather yet? Yes, I am. I have 13 grandchildren. That's right. I have eight children, 10 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. And we look good. <laughs> <laughs> um. We're going to have more time out in the hallway afterwards, but we have to clear the room soon. Yeah, we, have about, we have about one more minute, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, some of us are, like know from movies or books about people like you, I believe. And I just wanted to know if you could tell us, are there any that you think are realistic? Or if any are really bad, what's the worst and what's the best as far as movies? giving Books. us a sense? Books or TV shows, movies? Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, mm -hmm. Mass Incarceration at a Time of Color Blindness, yeah. and Doug Blackman's book, Slavery by Another Name. Yes, the same two that I would say. Those are great books, and they are totally, totally, totally nonfiction. <laughs> Please check them out. Also, um, uh, Angela Davis's Our Prisons Are Obsolete. Those are great books. As a final word, any final words to the Harvard Law community that you want? And this book. <laughs> any final words to the Harvard Law community before we uh, part ways? Don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> um, you never know who you're sitting next to, who you or and and for those of you sitting in this classroom, I'm really led to say that there are so many of you who are getting these ideas. In your mind, you wake up in the middle of the night, you write these notes, and you go, nobody's going to listen to me. When am I ever going to use this? How am I ever going to use this? Don't forget that. Don't forget those notes. Keep them. Because you are going to make a difference in this world. I look around this room, and I am looking at an inclusive room. And I would say to you to continue to practice law. Continue to practice justice and jurisprudence in this country with the same inclusion that you see sitting in this room. Donna and I talked about you guys all the way here. We love, we love the thought of the work that you are doing. You're talking about how progressive 
this campus is. Since 1636, you were founded. The law school, 200 years old. And I was just appreciating you all for last year honoring the slave labor that contributed to the wealth that built the law school. We appreciate these things. And I just want to say this. In a Western African country, the way they greet each other in the mornings or when they come upon each other, you know what they say? Instead of, good morning, how you doing? They ask the question, how are the children? Because like Whitney Houston say, I believe the children are the future. <laughs> Keep them well and let them lead the way. Mm -hmm. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a strength, a sense of pride, okay, to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us of how we used to be. So just remember, it's about the well-being of the children. We've got a lot of children with a lot of prison, a lot of parents in prison. And we've got to do something about this incarceration nation. And guess what? You guys are better suited to do it than anybody else. So use your gifts and your talents, please. Thank you, everyone. Let's hear it for Carl Ritter.